title of our talk today is a motor theory of sleep control. So before we start, please make sure that you are all in mute mode. I'd like to remind you all that uh, we allow questions during the talk, but there will be also time for questions at the end of the talk. And please welcome with me, Professor Dan. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, David, for uh, inviting me. Um, I so wish that I could visit in person. Um, I've been to Israel twice, and every single time the uh, experience was just uh, magical. In fact, uh, the last time was exactly two years ago, uh, and I spent a wonderful day with uh, Haggai. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about sleep. So uh, sleep is a innate behavior. Um, we know how to sleep even before we're born. Uh, as far as we know, all animals sleep, uh, including flies and worms, uh, even jellyfish uh, without a central nervous system. So um, for non-mammalian animals, sleep is uh, detected exclusively based on a lack of movement. Um, so in order to score a sleep episode, the animal has to uh, be stay still for a certain period of time. And uh, if you apply mild sensory stimulation, they show no motor response. For mammalian animals, we measure EEG and EMG. So the EMG measures uh, skeletal muscle tone. And during sleep, there's a clear reduction of uh, EMG. And the EEG uh, reflects uh, the state of the brain. Uh, so in general, the so-called desynchronized EEG, uh, low amplitude, uh, high frequency, uh, is associated with um, conscious awareness, uh, such as during wakefulness and REM sleep when we dream. And the synchronized EEG, uh, that happens during non-REM sleep is associated with dull or absence of mental experience. And then for humans, we measure EEG and EMG and also a few other things uh, such as heartbeat and breathing. And when we fall asleep, uh, at the, both the heart rate and breathing rate slow down. So the point is that uh, sleep is not just about changing the conscious state of the brain. It's also about the reduction of both the somatic motor activity and the autonomic motor activity. So my lab is interested in uh, the neural mechanisms controlling sleep. And what I hope to convince you today is that uh, a lot of the neurons controlling sleep are really part of the motor circuits controlling these two types of movement, uh, the somatic and autonomic motor activity. So after the discovery of the ascending arousal system by Morusi and Magung, uh, we know a lot about the arousal system. Uh, so in particular, the monoaminergic neurons uh, like noradrenaline, dopamine, uh, and some other neurons like serotonin, uh, histamine, um, acetylcholine system, and also some peptidergic systems, such as the orexin system. So these are all in these uh, subcortical brain structures. In contrast, uh, we know much less about the neural circuits controlling sleep. So according to the textbook, uh, there's a single center, sleep center, in the anterior hypothalamus. Uh, it's called the preoptic area, or the POA. So the idea is that the POA contains uh, a group of neurons that promote sleep by inhibiting a lot of these uh, known wake promoting neurons. And indeed, uh, using retrograde, uh, okay, so uh, using retrograde labeling from some of these wake centers and followed by gene profiling, we were able to identify a subset of the POA neurons that promote sleep. But it turns out that this is far from the whole story. About five or six years ago, uh, we and others have also found some sleep neurons outside of the POA. And that suggests that the network is much more distributed. So to try to get an idea of what the entire sleep control network might look like, uh, we decided to do a whole brain screening for sleep neurons. 
So we have two basic criteria for sleep neurons. Uh, one is that um, they need to be sleep promoting. Uh, so their activation should increase sleep and their inactivation should decrease sleep. And the other is that they should be sleep active so that they need to be active at the right time to do their job. And when we did screening, we also had two corresponding strategies. Uh, we could either screen for sleep promoting neurons uh, and then let's see if they're also sleep active, or we can screen for sleep active neurons and see if they're also sleep promoting. And so we use both strategies. And today I'm gonna uh, take you through some examples of both. So um, first uh, to screen for sleep active neurons, we use uh, the false trap technique uh, developed by Lee Chun Luo's lab. We cross two mouse lines together. Uh, one of them uh, ex expresses CRE-ER under the FOSS promoter. So we know that FOSS is a immediate early gene and uh, it's, uh, it's turned on when the neurons are active. So the idea is that whatever neurons that are active should express CRE-ER. And then the other mouse line uh, expresses uh, a fluorescent marker, in this case, GFP. So we decide, uh, divided these uh, cross mice into two groups. Um, I keep having trouble advancing, okay. So in one group, we call the uh, SD mice. So these are sleep deprived mice. Um, the idea is that we sleep deprive them for six hours and uh, inject tamoxifen during the sleep deprivation so that the wake active neurons that are active during sleep deprivation will uh, turn on FOSS and express CRE-ER and then tamoxifen uh, can cause the CRE-ER to enter the nucleus and cause permanent labeling of the wake active neurons. And then in the recovery sleep group or uh, RS group, we first sleep deprive them uh, and then we allow them to go to recovery sleep. And then the injection of tamoxifen during this second period uh, allows the labeling of the sleep active neurons. So when we uh, compare these two groups of mice, uh, we see that uh, they show different levels of labeling in many brain areas. So some with more labeling in the RS group and some in the SD group. So if we look at this uh, top bar here uh, with the highest relative expression in the RS group, uh, it's shown here. So this is the uh, ventral region of the periaqueductal gray. So this is the aqueduct. Uh, and so you can see that there are a lot more neurons in the RS group uh, than the SD group. So we wanted to know what these labeled putative sleep neurons are. And to do that, uh, we did uh, gene profiling. So the uh, reporter mouse line uh, we used expresses not only GFP, but also this ribosomal protein, O10A, uh, which is normally attached to mRNA for protein synthesis. So if we use an antibody against GFP to pull down GFP, we can also pull down O10A uh, together with the mRNA, and then we can do the sequencing. So uh, this is what they call the volcano plot. Uh, so each dot is a gene. Uh, the horizontal axis is the relative expression level of that gene in the putative sleep neurons compared to the entire chunk of tissue, this red square here, and the vertical is the p-value. So if we zoom in to this red box here, right? So these are the highly significantly enriched genes. Uh, then we see a, a bunch of genes. We decided to focus on neuropeptides uh, because we know they're important for signaling and also because there are a lot of uh, Cre mouse lines associated with peptides. So in this box here, there are three neuropeptides, uh, these three dot red dots here. And among the three of them, uh, CALCA, which is a calcitonin gene related peptide alpha, uh, it uh, shows a high overlap with the trap labeling of the putative sleep neurons. So we decided to focus on the CALCA marker. And to target the CALCA neurons, we used a CALCA CRE mouse line uh, uh, generated by Richard Palmiter's lab. 
So first, we wanted to uh, make sure that these neurons are really sleep active because uh, CFOS is actually not a perfect uh, indicator of activity. It also depends on other things. So to test directly, we use uh, output recording. We tap these calcar neurons uh, with tanrodopsin uh, by injecting a cre-inducible uh, virus into the calcar cre mice. And for recording, we use uh, optrode uh, with uh, optic fiber here, uh, surrounded by several bundles of wires. So here you can see a unit. Uh, every time we turn on the laser, the little blue dot here uh, for five millisecond, uh, it evoked a spike reliably uh, at a very short latency. So we're pretty sure that this is a neuron that expresses channel dopsin, and therefore it should be a calcar cell. And so once we identify a calcar neuron, we uh, just look at the spontaneous activity without the laser pulses. So here is the firing rate of one cell. Uh, and so this is the uh, EEG power spectrum. Uh, this is the EMG trace. And this is the color-coded brain state uh, classified based on EEG and EMG. And so you can see that this cell has a high firing rate during non-REM sleep, uh, these orange periods, and low firing rates during both wake, uh, which is gray, and also REM, uh, which is blue. So um, here, uh, each line is one cell. Uh, this is a summary of, of about 30 cells. Um, uh, there are firing rates across the brain state. And so we also routinely use um, this kind of two-dimensional plot to summarize the, the, the firing rates of the cells. The horizontal axis is the firing rate difference between non-run and wakefulness uh, normalized by their sum. And the vertical is the rate difference between REM sleep and wakefulness. So the identified units, these are the calcar cells, uh, the blue dots, uh, most of them are on the right-hand side, uh, indicating that they're more active during non-REM uh, than wakefulness. Uh, they don't care too much about REM sleep versus wakefulness. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the unidentified units recorded in the same area, uh, these gray dots, they're really all over the place. Uh, many of them are on the left, so these are wake active. So it seems like most of the identified calcar neurons are indeed uh, non-REM sleep active. So this is our first uh, criterion for being a sleep neuron. So now the question is, uh, are they sleep promoting? So for that, uh, we just did a simple channel adoption uh, activation. So this is our standard uh, experimental protocol and you see this over and over again uh, in my talk. Um, so again, you're seeing the EEG power spectrum, uh, EMG brain state, and the blue shading indicates the laser stimulation period. So we, uh, for each trial, we turn on a laser for two minutes and with a semi-random intertrial interval of somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, minutes. So all of this is randomly controlled by the computer. And so here is a summary of all the mice and all the trials that we tested. Um, so each line is the probability of each brain state. Um, this is before, uh, during, right, the blue shading, laser stimulation, and afterwards. So you can see that uh, when we turn on the laser at time zero, there's a pretty immediate uh, increase in non-REM sleep and decrease in both wakefulness and REM sleep. In contrast, if we um, inactivate these cells uh, using the inhibitory opsin IC++, that's, that caused the opposite effect, a decrease in uh, non-REM sleep. So in addition to uh, optogenetic experiments, we also did chemogenetic activation and inactivation. So here is activation, uh, the open circles are control and solid are um, CNO uh, activation through GQ. And so activation also caused an increase in non-REM sleep. And below here is the inactivation through GI. So uh, CNO caused a decrease in non-REM sleep. So based on um, both optogenetic and chemogenetic activation and inactivation, uh, we know that uh, these calcar neurons are indeed non-REM promoting, which is our second criterion. 
Okay, so um, so I told you that we found this peptide marker, uh, calca, but it turns out that uh, these neurons, these peptide neurons, most of them also express a traditional neurotransmitter. And among the calca population in this brain region, uh, about 60 to 70% of them are actually glutamatergic, uh, so they express uh, VGLU2. And the other 30 or 40% are actually cholinergic. Um, they express uh, CHAT. So without showing you the data, I'll just tell you that we think that the sleep effect is mostly mediated by the glutamatergic subset of the calcium neurons. And also for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip over some other data, but I'll tell you a couple of other things that we have found. One is that in addition to the calca neurons, we found another population of glutamatergic neurons uh, that express the uh, peptide CCK, cholecystokinin. So the calca and CCK neurons are sitting right next door to each other, and they're actually connected to each other. So we confirm this with a slice recording. Both of them actually project to the POA, which is the textbook uh, sleep center. And the calcium neurons also project to this uh, brainstem region uh, called the GIV. So both the POA and the GIV contain GABAergic neurons that promote sleep by inhibiting a lot of these awake neurons like monoaminergic neurons and cholinergic neurons. So it seems like the, uh, the ventral region of the pack might be an excitatory sleep center that's just upstream of these inhibitory sleep centers. So this seems to be sort of a, a logic of the circuit, di uh, the circuit that we have seen. Yang, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so is this the same population that Richard Palmiter was studying in the original study where he developed these mice? No, so Richard Palmiter was studying the, the parabrachial nucleus. Uh, so those are actually in the brainstem. So, th so the PAG is in the midbrain. Um, so the, re the, the region that the Palmiter lab studies a lot is, uh, is, is more posterior and, and more lateral. It's called the parabrachial. And so his lab was uh, you know, studying a lot of the feeding related behavior. Okay, so there's no contradiction between the, the studies. They live uh, all side by side. Right, yeah, so th these are entirely different populations. Although, you know, it's, it's a good question. I think that deep down, uh, sleep is related to a lot of other behavior. Uh, feeding is probably one of them. So I kept thinking about it, but so far we haven't done anything uh, in, that, in that direction. Okay, so now I'm gonna to switch to uh, the other strategy, which is to screen for sleep promoting neurons. So we did this uh, based on a very simple minded idea. So we're gonna start with the wake promoting neurons. Uh, we know a lot of them. And we're gonna use retrograde tracing to find inhibitory neurons that inhibit these wake promoting neurons. And so the idea is that if you have a neuron that inhibits wake neurons, then perhaps this activity could promote sleep. And then once we find these inhibitory sleep neurons, we're gonna trace one more step back and look for their excitatory input. Because uh, if you have a neuron that excites uh, sleep promoting neurons, then it could be promoting sleep itself. So this was done by a really talented postdoc, a Chen Yan Ma in my lab. Uh, what Chen Yin did was to target a whole bunch of wake promoting neurons. So like I said, we know many populations of wake promoting neurons. And Chen Yin was looking for brain regions with relatively broad GABAergic uh, innervation of these wake centers. So uh, here's a summary of the first uh, round of screening that Chen Yin did. So these are seven populations of wake promoting neurons that she targeted, uh, including uh, histaminergic, uh, cholinergic, uh, glutamatergic, noradrenergic, uh, and, and GABAergic, I think. And these are, uh, you know, these are a set of brain regions with relatively broad GABAergic innervation. So these bars indicate uh, the, 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 um, the number of uh, rabies cell, labeled cells that we see uh, for that target region. 
So among these candidate regions, we did find POA, right, which is a textbook version. So this is consistent with the textbook version of how the POA promotes sleep. But to our surprise, the top candidate that came out of this anatomical screening is actually the central nucleus of the amygdala, the CEA. So um, here uh, in each of the seven panels, I'm showing you an example uh, tracing from each of the seven uh, weight promoting populations that Chen Yin targeted. So in each case, if you zoom in to this little white square, uh, you can see um, uh, the green are the rabies labeled cells that overlap with the GAP or GIG marker, GAP one or two. Okay, so we want to know what these uh, GAP or GIG neurons are because we know that uh, you know, the CEA is associated with fear learning and people in that field have, have shown that the CEA is actually incredibly diverse functionally. So we have to figure out what the subset are. So again, we used uh, sequencing for that purpose. And so this is the same volcano plot. And again, if you zoom in to this uh, highly significantly enriched box, uh, again, a bunch of genes, and we again saw three neuropeptides, uh, prodynorphin, uh, tachykinin-2, and neurotensin. And among the three of them, uh, they actually partially overlap with each other. Um, but we, for various reasons, we decided to focus on neurotensin because it shows the highest degree of overlap with the rabies uh, labeled uh, presynaptic neurons. So uh, first we wanted to see whether these neurotensin neurons uh, indeed promote sleep. So again, this is activation. Uh, and you can see increase in non-REM sleep, uh, inactivation, decrease in non-REM sleep. So basically these neurons are indeed non-REM promoting because our logic was based on synaptic connection, uh, but this is a direct functional test. So next, are they non-REM active? So again, uh, optical recording, uh, here's an example cell, and this is again that two-dimensional uh, summary. So the identified blue units, so these are the NTS neurons, most of them are in the upper right quadrant. Uh, so this indicates that these neurons are more active during both non-REM and REM sleep compared to wakefulness. But the unidentified gray units are again uh, much more scattered. So it seems like the NTS neurons, the majority of them are also sleep active. Okay, so now we have found the population of garbage neurons that are uh, sleep neurons. And as promised, we're gonna trace one more step back and look for their excitatory input. So one region that Chen Yan found uh, with uh, relatively strong glutamatergic projection to the CA neurons is shown here. So this is uh, the posterior part of the thalamus. So this uh, red blob here uh, labeled by VGLU2 correspond to this red region here. So this is the thalamus. And so you can see that the rabies labeled cells, right? So that these are the presynaptic cells innervating the CEA. Uh, these are sort of at the medial edge of the posterior thalamus. And amazingly, these glutamatergic neurons also express neurotensin, right? Which is the marker that we found for the GABAergic neurons. So now we tested these posterior thalamic uh, NTS neurons. And again, activation increased sleep and inactivation decreased sleep. Okay, so now we have found two populations of sleep neurons, right? One is glutamatergic and the other is GABAergic, and yet both of them express neurotensin. So now the immediate question is, what does neurotensin do, right? Because our initial circuit tracing was based on the simple-minded excitation, glutamatergic, inhibition, GABAergic. But, you know, but then neuropeptide also seems to figure pretty prominently. So we wanted to know whether neurotensin plays a role uh, in, in, sleep, in the sleep effect. So what Chen Yan did was to use CRISPR-Cas9 mediated knockdown. So this is a, a very complicated construct uh, designed entirely by Chen Yan. I wouldn't be able to dream up something as complicated as this. But the point is that um, the part that I understand the, the best is that 
it contains this guide RNA against neurotensin. So when you inject this into this mouse uh, that's a cross between NTS Cree and this reporter mouse expressing Cas9, uh, and then this guide RNA can guide Cas9 to uh, sort of nick the DNA for neurotensin and, and knock it down. And as you can see here, uh, indeed, compared to control, uh, which express neurotensin uh, with uh, NTS guide RNA construct, uh, it caused a great reduction of NTS expression. So that's true for both the CEA and also the posterior thalamus. So now we can test the effect, uh, you know, after the knockdown, whether these cells can still promote sleep. So here's a summary of the data. Now the white bar is just the control, right? So we still injected this complicated construct, except that the guide RNA is just a random guide RNA that doesn't do anything. And so, so you can see that uh, channel adoption activation caused an increase in sleep. So this is just a repetition of our original experiment. But when you knock down NTS, the laser induced uh, increase in sleep is greatly reduced. So that's true for both the CEA and the posterior thalamus. But on top of that, uh, in the CEA, if we knock down um, this VGAT, which is a, a GABA transporter, uh, which is SLC32A1, 32, uh, that also greatly reduce uh, the effect of these neurons in promoting sleep. And in the posterior thalamus, if we knock down VGLU2, right, which is encoded by this gene, that also pretty much wiped out the effect of these cells in promoting sleep. So the conclusion is that uh, in both the uh, uh, amygdala and the posterior thalamus, both the neuropeptide NTS and the traditional transmitter, either glutamate or GABA, are required for the sleep promoting effect of these cells. Okay, so just to quickly summarize, we have found two populations of NTS neurons in the CEA and also the, the thalamus. And, um, uh, and actually both the peptide and the traditional transmitters are important. So um, I also just want to sort of emphasize, uh, highlight two points, again, skipping a bunch of data. So one of them is that it turns out that neurotensin is a pretty general marker for multiple non-run uh, neuron populations. I just showed you the data about the CEA and the thalamus, but in addition, um, without showing the data, we also found a population in the ventral lateral pack, right, which I talked about this structure before. So these are also glutamatergic. There's another population in the subthalamic nucleus, and these are also glutamatergic. So it turns out that all of these, right, some are inhibitory, some are excitatory, but uh, neurotensin is a common denominator and all of them promote non-REM sleep. The other is that the ventral region of the pack really seems to be an upstream excitatory sleep center because in addition to CALCA and CCK that I mentioned, uh, also they contain NTS neurons and all of them project to some downstream GABAergic sleep centers that uh, promote sleep by inhibiting the wake neurons. I should also mention that in addition to a bunch of papers that we published in my lab, um, these two conclusions are very much confirmed by uh, Yu Haya uh, Hayashi's lab uh, in a paper that came out last year. So it's very gratifying to see uh, you know, what we found uh, can be reproduced by other labs. Okay, so um, as I mentioned that Chen Yan found a whole bunch of regions uh, and in addition to CEA and POA, the third candidate region is actually uh, the substantia nigra uh, SNR. So um, as many of you know that, uh, I mean, especially uh, here, um, there are some real experts, right? So SNR is uh, the output stage of the basal ganglia. And so we all know that it's mostly controlling movement. And so in order to understand how a movement control circuit um, come up with this in this sort of screening for sleep neurons, uh, we wanted to sort of have an idea of what's the relationship between sleep and movement. Uh, so, so this is uh, done by uh, Dan Chen Liu, another postdoc in the lab. 
So um, in order to answer that question, uh, we wanted to take a closer look at the motor activity of the mice. So in addition to EEG and EMG, we added a video recording. And our collaborators uh, in Beijing, uh, they uh, helped us to train a uh, neural network deep learning, uh, it's called the UNET for image segmentation. So here's the original image uh, recorded by the video camera. And this is where the algorithm thinks the mouse is. And you can, you can see that it's pretty good. And once we have this automatic uh, segmentation, it's pretty easy to extract some parameters about movement. So we focus on two parameters. One of them is translation. So we basically uh, look at the center of mass of the mouse in two different time frames and see how much it moved. Uh, the other is what we call the total movement. So it's basically the total number of pixels that are different between the two frames. So in this case is all the blue pixels uh, in these uh, two frames. So once we plot these two uh, parameters, uh, basically across the entire recording, uh, we found three clusters. So the dark green cluster corresponds to locomotion, right? So this is the biggest movement, right? Both parameters have large values, right? The mouse is running around. The light green cluster corresponds to all the non-local motor movement, right? So it could be eating, grooming, or some postural adjustment. So I should say that, you know, nowadays there are a lot of uh, really nice softwares for automatic uh, movement classification, behavior classification. Um, we did our own version uh, specifically because we wanted to have a coarse grained sort of classification. We actually didn't care about the specific kind of fine movement, fine motor control, because we're interested in sort of the general state of the animal, right? Uh, so, so that's why we lumped all the non-local motor movement, kind of smaller movement into one cluster. The third cluster, the gray cluster, corresponds to immobility. But if we look at the EEG and EMG, it turns out that there are also two clusters. One of them is quiet wakefulness and the other is really uh, sleep. So we basically have four kind of behavior states. So here I'm showing you the normalized EEG delta power. Delta is one to four hertz by the low frequency activity uh, across the four behavior states. And here's the EEG power of the four states. So the point I want to make here is that now, if you think about the three green-ish states, right? So these are all wake states. So we tend to think of their difference in terms of their motor activity, right? On the other hand, if you look at their EEG, they're also a very clear difference, right? So I should say that the EEG delta power, the higher the delta, the less aroused the brain is, right? So it corresponds to the kind of slow synchronized activity that I showed earlier. Now, if you look at the quiet wakefulness and the sleep states, right? Both of them are immobility states, right? Which is why the video camera uh, classification, they belong to the same cluster. So we tend to think of their difference in terms of uh, the brain state difference. On the other hand, if you look at the EMG, there, there's also a clear difference, right? So the point is that brain state and motor state uh, measured coarsely by EMG, they're correlated across multiple behavior states. Okay, so when we looked at the transitions across these behavior states, it turns out they're not random at all. For example, if we start out in locomotion, they always transition, if at all, uh, into non-locomotor movement. We have never seen a case where the animal was like running in one moment and bam, just fall asleep next moment, right? It's just like, you know, we humans, we don't do that. We need to gradually wind down, right? So for, uh, if they start out in non-locomotor movement, they either go back to running or they go into quiet wakefulness. They also don't go directly into sleep. So in other words, if you, um, line up these four behavior states in a single chain, then most of the transitions are between neighboring states. So this is the transition matrix, white indicates zero, right? 
So uh, the diagonal means staying in the same state uh, from one moment to the next, so which is a high probability. Now, right above the diagonal uh, means going down the chain one step at a time, and below the diagonal means uh, going up the chain. So the only jump, right, skipping a state is sometimes the animal would wake up, get out of sleep, and they go into movement right away and they skip quiet wakefulness. And all of the other transitions are between the neighboring states. Okay, so this is the behavior. And what about the neural circuit? Now, it turns out that uh, in the SNR, there are two types of GABA urging neurons in the mouse. I don't know about monkeys, right? But in the mouse, uh, that seems to be the case. So if we inject a cre inducible virus into a PV, parvalvumin cre mice, we mostly label the PV positive neurons in the lateral SNR. But if we inject it into a GAT2 cre mouse, uh, it mostly label, uh, labels the medial SNR. So these are the neurons that are PV negative. And I should say that, uh, in fact, exactly two years ago when I was in Israel, uh, I talked about a more preliminary version of this uh, story. And, um, and Haggai was the one who sort of got me thinking about the medial versus lateral SNR. And uh, we went back and trying to separate them. And more or less by accident, we found that we could actually target the medial SNR by, uh, using the GAT2 cream mice. So anyway, so now we have the ability to target the two sets of GABA urging neurons in the SNR. So first, uh, we recorded from the PV positive neurons, uh, again, using auto recording, right, uh, uh, CHR2 tagging. So here's a summary of the PV neurons. So most of these neurons, right, each line is one cell. So most of these neurons are most active during local motion less active during non-local motor movement, and they're least active uh, during sleep. But if we record from the GAT2 cells, right, in the medial SNR, most of them are most active during sleep and actually less active during uh, movement. So here I'm just showing you the uh, superimposed population average, right? So the magenta is GAT2 and the cyan is the PV population. So they show the opposite trend uh, at the population level, even though individually there's quite a bit of variability. Okay, so now we did optogenetic uh, manipulation. So when we uh, activated the GAT2 cells, we saw, uh, again, during a two minutes la uh, laser, we saw a huge reduction of both locomotion and other movements and significant increase in sleep. But when we activated the PV cells, right, so these are the lateral, lateral cells, we saw very little increase in sleep. And the main effect we saw was a basically termination of movement and they get into quiet wakefulness. Oops. And uh, when we inactivated the GAT2 cells, uh, we saw a huge increase in movement and a huge decrease in sleep. Uh, and then the effect of PV neuron inactivation has a much weaker effect. Okay, so just to quickly summarize, right? So the PV neurons are actually movement activated, right? Remember they're most active during movement and yet their activation mainly terminates movement. So we think this is because, I mean, you know, I'm no expert in basal ganglia, but this is based on reading papers and stuff and also talking to Hakai. We think that this is probably because the PV neurons are important for action selection, right? So when we make any particular movement, we also need to suppress the other sort of competing movements. And so if PV neurons are important for selection, um, that might be why, uh, whenever the animals are moving, there are always some PV neurons that are active to suppress the competing movements. And yet when you activate the entire population, the main effect is to terminate all movement. But in contrast, the GAT2 cells are movement suppressed, right? so these are sleep active, and their activation really suppresses movement and enhances sleep. So even though the GAT2 neurons really suppress movement and enhance sleep, 
they did not do so by causing direct movement to sleep transition, which is not normally uh, observed uh, under the natural condition. Instead, what they do is to bias the probability of the natural transitions. So this is the matrix, right? So this is the uh, change induced by GAT2 neuron activation. So all the transitions above the diagonal are enhanced and the other ones are suppressed. So basically all the downward transitions are enhanced. So now I again sort of wanted to, to, to make a separate point, right? Now, if you think about it, the locomotion to movement transition, we think of it as sort of motor control, right? Because you activate neurons and, and you cause a change in the motor behavior, right? So this is motor control. Now, movement to quiet wakefulness, we also think of it as motor control. But from quiet wakefulness to sleep, right? These are immobility states, and yet there's a brain state change. So we think of this in terms of brain state control. Now, even though we give these transitions different names, but these neurons really, they don't seem to care, right? Because if you activate these cells, all they do is just to push the animal down the chain one step at a time, right? Depending on where you are, you just sort of push it down. So, so I think that that's kind of important realization that sometimes our conceptualization this kind of artificial divide um, might actually be limiting our thinking. Okay, so that's activation and uh, inactivation, again, does not cause any artificial transitions. Uh, what it does is to bias the direction of the natural transitions. So next we looked at the projections of these cells. Now the PV cells, uh, they project to uh, the motor region of the thalamus, the motor layers of the superior colliculus. And this region, uh, I think a lot of people call it the midbrain locomotor region. Uh, it's a, very much associated with locomotor movement. Now the GAT2 cells project to all of these motor regions, but in addition, they also project to the dorsal raphe containing both the serotonin neurons and the uh, some dope, uh, some dopaminergic neurons that are important for arousal. They also project the locus julius containing the noradrenergic neurons. And when we used a virus trick to um, label the subset of the SNR neurons that project the thalamus, we also see their axon collaterals in all of these motor regions and also in the dorsal raphe and the uh, locus julius. Uh, but, and when we, act, uh, when we labeled the subset of the SNR neurons that project to the dorsal raphe, we also saw their axon collaterals to these motor regions, uh, including the thalamus. So it really seems like it's the same population of SNR neurons that send axon collaterals to these motor control regions, as well as these putative brain state control regions. Okay, so now I just told you about the SNR, which clearly plays a very important role in controlling uh, somatic movement uh, measured by EMG. Uh, I also mentioned that falling asleep is associated with the reduction of the autonomic motor activity. So I'm gonna spend the remaining few minutes to tell you about another circuit uh, controlling the cardiovascular system. And that's the barrel reflex circuit characterized by Yuan Yuan Yao in my lab. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with this, the barrel reflex is a very rapid negative feedback loop uh, to stabilize blood pressure. The idea is that any increase in the blood pressure uh, sensed by the barrel receptors in the periphery, um, these cells, sensory neurons, project to the nucleus of the solitary tract. Uh, we call it the MST uh, in the brainstem. And that triggers some downstream effects, a uh, uh, reduction of the heart rate and also the smooth muscles uh, lining up the blood vessels to reduce the blood pressure for stabilization. So uh, this circuit is actually very well worked out. There are actually two branches. Uh, the nucleus of the solitary tract uh, sends excitatory projection to the nucleus uh, ambiguous. So the ambiguous nucleus contains cholinergic neurons that are preganglionic uh, parasympathetic. So they mostly project to the heart to slow down the heart rate. 
The other branch, uh, again, excitatory projection, projecting to the so-called CVLM, uh, caudal ventral lateral medulla, a name doesn't matter. Um, so these are the GABAergic neurons that inhibit the rostral ventral lateral medulla neurons, which are actually sympathetic. So some of these neurons are actually adrenergic, right? So they, again, project to the periphery to activate the sympathetic system. So first, uh, to test uh, the function of the circuit in sleep control, first we wanted to isolate the neurons in the solitary tract that are involved in baroreflex because the solitary tract does a lot of different things. For that, we again use the trap strategy uh, developed by Li Chun Luo's lab, again crossing the mouse, uh, the two mouse lines together. And to activate the baroreceptors, we injected this drug called the phenyl phenylephrine. Uh, PE, which uh, increase the blood pressure. Uh, as you can see, the blood pressure is indeed, uh, indeed increased for a couple of hours. And if we inject tamoxifen during this period, we can uh, label genetically the PE activated neurons. And so here you can see in the solitary tract, there are a lot of labeled uh, TD tomato labeled neurons uh, induced by PE. Uh, in the saline control, right? So if you inject saline uh, with tamoxifen, uh, then we label much fewer neurons. So just so to, to show that uh, the PE injection was effective. So next, we wanted to make sure that these labeled neurons are indeed doing what we think they're doing, right? Uh, which is baroreflex. So we uh, directly recorded their activity, again, using output recording. So in this case, in addition to uh, the output recording, we also had uh, a wireless recording device for blood pressure and uh, the ECG. So here you can see the blood pressure, ECG, and here's uh, the spike, right? So this is laser. Uh, induced spiking, so we know that this is a channel that's in a channel that's intact cell. Okay, so here is about uh, maybe 20 minutes of recording. Um, so you can see that the blood pressure is um, fluctuating because the mouse was like moving around in the cage, uh, so is the heart rate. And so here is a firing rate of an identified cell. Now the firing rate change pretty much follows the blood pressure change, right? So this is consistent with the idea that these neurons are barosensitive. And if we zoom in temporally, we can see that about half of these cells uh, also their spiking is very time locked to the single heartbeats, right? So you can see that every heartbeat here, a lot of them are associated with a spike. And so this is the cross chronogram between the heartbeat and the spikes. So you can see this clear periodicity that correspond to the heart rate. So all of these is basically confirming that we are dealing with the cardiovascular related cells in the solitary tract. So next we uh, did optogenetic activation of these cells. Uh, so in addition to EEG and EMG, we also measured blood pressure and heart rate. So here's a single example and here's a summary. Now, when we turn on the laser, you see a very immediate drop in the blood pressure and also heart rate, right? So this is again, consistent with the idea that these are the cardiovascular cells. But in addition, we also saw a pretty clear increase in non-REM sleep. And so this is just a summary, the comparison between channel adoption versus EYP control. And so in addition to optogenetics, we also did chemogenetic activation, right? So activating these cells cause decrease in blood pressure and heart rate and also increase in non-REM sleep. So these cells are indeed uh, non-REM promoting. Okay, so, so that's the first stage is the solitary tract. Um, so next, we wanted to look at the two downstream pathways, right? So the NSC sends excitation to the CVLM, right? So we activated the CVLM GABAergic neurons using a GAT2 Cre mouse. And so again, here's a single example, and here's a summary, right? So increase in non-REM sleep. And we think that this effect is partly mediated by the inhibition of the RVLM, right? So this is according to the circuit that people have already figured out. So to test that, we directly inhibited RVLM using IC++. And indeed, 
that was enough to cause a increase in non-REM sleep. So we think that the effect of CVLM activation is probably partly mediated by the inhibition of this. In contrast, if we inhibit the CVLM cells, uh, we saw a decrease in sleep and increase in wakefulness. Uh, and if we activate the RVLM cells, we saw the opposite, right? So again, increase in wakefulness and decrease in sleep. So basically every stage along this branch of the baroreflex pathway works out. They all have a sleep regulation effect. So now what about this other pathway? So uh, because the nucleus of the, uh, the, the ambiguous nucleus is a very thin and long structure, and that makes it very difficult to use a single optic fiber to activate many of the cells. And in fact, we tried it and sometimes we see some effect and, and, and not others, it's just not very reliable. So we decided to focus on chemogenetic activation. So we injected the virus at multiple anterior posterior locations. And then once you uh, inject CNO in the whole body, it sort of activates all the neurons. And so chemogenetic activation of these cholinergic cells, again, caused an increase in non-REM sleep and decrease in wakefulness. And of course, together with a decrease in the heart rate. Okay, so, uh, so those are all the data I wanted to share with you today. Um, so at the very beginning, I said that uh, falling asleep is not just about changing the state of consciousness, it's also about reduction of both the somatic and autonomic motor activity. So it, you know, given all of these things that are happening during sleep, it kind of makes sense for the sleep control mechanism to inhibit right, both the arousal system and the two types of motor systems. Now, for the somatic motor system, uh, I showed you an example, which is the uh, substantia nigra, right, part of the basal ganglia, clearly important for somatic motor control. Now, for the autonomic uh, motor system, uh, I just told you about the solitary tract together with the rest of the cardiovascular uh, baroreflex circuit. And in our other screening, I talked about the periaqueductal gray, right? The amygdala, the CEA, right? And also the hypothalamus, the, the POA is part of the hypothalamus. So it turns out that all of these structures are important nodes in the central autonomic network. So instead of being separate, right? Uh, as implied by this circuit diagram, it seems that the sleep mechanism deeply infiltrates both the somatic and the autonomic motor systems. So this is why I moved uh, the orange yellow circle, uh, single circle, uh, replaced with multiple and moved them into the two motor control boxes. Now, on the other hand, there might be a separation between the general state neurons uh, from the specific action neurons. So I mentioned this um, in specifically because in the SNR, right, we think that the PV neurons might be for action selection neurons, they're more specific, but the GA2 neurons might be more like the general state neurons. And the general state neurons are the ones that actually send axon collaterals, right, which we showed, uh, to both the arousal system and the motor control circuits so that they can coordinate uh, motor activity with the arousal state of the brain. So even though uh, everything I told you about today is about how we sleep, right? I didn't mention a single word about why we sleep. Um, so obviously that's an, a, another equally important question, but we think that this kind of view about how sleep is controlled might also have important implication about this question of why we sleep. Now, the fact that the sleep control mechanism is so closely associated with the motor control system suggests to us that perhaps a fundamental function of sleep is to promote processes incompatible with movement. Right? So we don't know what that process is, but we think that this incompatibility with movement uh, should provide an important uh, constraint. Now, there are many ideas about the function of sleep, including memory consolidation, synaptic homeostasis, maybe DNA repair. There's a very prominent Israeli group studying that. 
Um, but it could also be as simple as uh, maybe recovery from cellular fatigue, right? So if you think about movement, we know that the muscle cells after a lot of motor activity, they get fatigued, right? So you got to rest. Now we think that perhaps at least some of the neurons in the brain also get fatigue, cellular fatigue after prolonged wakefulness and they need some kind of recovery. So, uh, but of course, you know, fatigue is a very general term and what does it mean in terms of cell biology uh, is, is a deep question. So that's something that we're looking into uh, right now. So that's gonna be the future focus of my lab. Now that's it. And finally, I want to acknowledge the people who actually did all the work. I didn't do anything. I haven't been in the lab for several months already. <laughs> They're the ones that are laboring in the lab. Uh, so I mentioned their name. Ajo is the one who did the uh, screening for sleep active neurons. Chen Yan did the screening for sleep promoting neurons uh, uh, anatomically. Dan Qian characterized uh, the SNR and Yuan Yuan characterized the barrel reflex circuit. So a big shout out to all these brilliant and very dedicated women in my lab. Um, without them, I don't know where I would be today. Um, and I didn't talk about the data uh, by France and Xinjie and Min Xu. Um, so these are the three people who uh, were the first in my lab who started working on sleep about 10 years ago. Uh, at that time, I personally knew next to nothing about sleep. So they were really the ones who figured out how to study sleep and got several key techniques to work. And so among all of them, uh, these three all run in their own lab. Uh, Zhe and Dan Qian both got their jobs last year and uh, Chen Yan and Yuan Yuan are gonna be on the job market this year. Um, others also uh, contributed in my lab. We also have many collaborators who helped us with various techniques. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Yang. And we have time for questions, of course. Didi, can I ask Hagai speaking? Of course. Thank you, Yang. It was a beautiful visual. Uh, uh, speaking about the sympathetic and the motor system, from my point of view, there is a big difference between non-REM and REM sleep. In both of them, you don't move or move less, but uh, let's say that the non-REM sleep is more parasympathetic and the REM is more sympathetic. W what is your feeling about this kind of thing? So I have to say REM, uh, people call it paradoxical sleep, is incredibly paradoxical to me. I'm just <laughs> terribly confused about REM. Um, so, so REM, initially, I really believe, like you were saying, that it's sympathetic, right? But it turns out that that's not, um, I mean, you know, I actually still found it confusing in the literature. And I think part of the confusion is that people talk about tonic REM and phasic REM, right? So it turns out that, so my impression reading the literature, the, the confusion is that people, some people separate, some people don't, and they use the terms in different ways, right? Um, so, so my understanding is that during tonic REM, it's actually very parasympathetic dominant, but then during phasic REM, all hells break loose, right? I mean, things are just going crazy. So I'm not sure how to, um, I mean, so first of all, we, because REM is pretty rare in mice, right? It's, you know, if you record in the day, which is their, their bedtime, but only 8% of the time they spend in REM. So that sort of also makes it hard to study. And I haven't been able to figure out the phasic from tonic REM either. So I'm not sure how to think about it. We have no data uh, in, that, in that direction. I, I can share with you that also in the monkey, it is very not easy to discriminate between phasic and tonic rem and the, I completely agree that the literature is confusing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, but I think terribly interesting going on there, right? Just because it's confusing doesn't mean it's not interesting, but I just haven't figured out a way to sort of study it effectively. Thank you. Maybe I can ask a question. Um, so there's, Maybe you can clarify conceptually just to make it a little more um, defined. The distinction between, let's say we treat, I don't know, feeding or motor action. They are obviously mutually exclusive 
with sleep. But you're looking at, um, at motor correlated structures and saying that they're functional directly in sleep. So how would you, you know, experimentally and conceptually refine the distinction between mutually exclusive and directly functional, if, if you see what I mean? Yeah, so, you know, um, so I think that, you know, a pretty general problem in systems neuroscience is we all, um, you know, we all have tunnel vision, right? So each of us is interested in a particular behavior. And so everything is seen through the lens of that behavior, right? And a lot of the other behavior, they're not my business and I just ignore it, which I think is a big problem. And I have to say that I'm sort of guilty of the same thing. So as I mentioned, right, when we started out screening for sleep neurons, um, we have two criteria, right? If, you, if you're sleep active and if you're sleep promoting, right? Uh, and then of course, you know, anytime they, the animal is awake, is, is wake, is waking, we just, oh, that's just wake state, it's not sleep, right? But of course, like you were saying, during wakefulness, they have so many different behavior. It's just that, you know, in the past, it wasn't my department, I wasn't worried about that, right? And so of course, you know, but in recent years, I started thinking about that. And it's a very profound question, mutually exclusive, you know, what does it mean? So my justification for calling these sleep neurons is that, um, so, so the, these, neurons in the somatic motor system, you know, I talked about the SNR, right? So they suppress movement and we know that during sleep, they don't move. So from that point of view, you can say it's trivial, except that they don't just stop movement because we also measure the EEG. And so if you look at the, the increase, you know, if you look at the increase in non-REM sleep induced by our activation of these cells, they look identical to the natural sleep. Right. So if you use our simple, very mechanical definition, these are sleep promoting. Right. So, I mean, I think that from a factual point of view, that's the only thing I can say. But I think that you're asking a more sort of philosophical question. How do we think about the relationship? You know, is my definition of sleep neurons being too liberal? Right. We can debate about that. But based on that very simple definition, you know, I think I'm justified to call these SNR GAT2 neurons sleep neurons because they are sleep active and they're sleep promoting. Okay. But no, you're right, right? It is. I mean, it's, the, it's a philosophical question with a concrete, you know, distinct experimental distinction where you draw the line and what is the criteria and your criteria and saying, I also have this EG signal which for me is a signal of sleep, then I think that uh, clarifies where the boundary lies. So that's the other thing that this SNR study really taught me, right? Because, um, you know, the, I never thought, I mean, I sort of knew Carl Peterson's work and stuff, but I just never thought about it that way, right? These different movement states when they're running or when they're eating or something, their EEG actually look very different, except for people who study those behaviors, who would bother measure their EEG, <laughs> right? Uh, and then of course, you know, for, for uh, quiet wakefulness for sleep, and that's something that I cared about very deeply because EEG is what we do for living, right? But of course there's also EMG difference. And of course, you know, once you look back, you're like, I think that you and I talked about this, right? So when you're, you know, if you fall asleep when you're sitting there in a flight or something, you tip over because you lose your, your neck muscle tone, right? And so we knew the quiet wakefulness and sleep, there is a difference, clear difference in, in motor activity as well. More questions? Okay, so I think we'll stop here. Uh, and uh, thank you again, Yang Dan, for a fascinating talk. And again, uh, for, uh, for the effort of uh, fighting the tank difference, we really appreciate it. And we hope, we all hope to see you soon in Israel. I'd love to visit. Thank you so much.